Welcome to Learning English, a daily thirty-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. On today's program, we tell you about a new U.S. government report that examines mass attacks in the country over the past five years. Later, Brian Lynn presents this week's technology report. We close with the next part of our U.S. history series. But first. A new government report says half of the mass attacks in the United States over the past few years started as personal, family, or workplace disputes. The attackers, the report found, were mostly men. The attackers often had a history of mental health issues, money problems, or domestic violence. Their weapons of choice: guns. The report was released Wednesday by the U.S. Secret Service's National Threat Assessment Center. The seventy-page report studied one hundred seventy-three mass attacks carried out over a five-year period, from January twenty sixteen to December twenty twenty. The mass attacks happened in places such as businesses, schools, and religious centers. The attacks killed a total of five hundred thirteen people, and injured one thousand two hundred thirty-four. It's just happening way too often," said Lena Alathari, the center's director. Alathari said that. While the center did not study the two most recent shootings in California, there are themes seen over and over again when studying mass attacks. Officials said the suspects in both recent California shootings were older men; they both used semi-automatic guns. The report is the latest in a series undertaken by the center to examine mass attacks. Earlier reports examined the years of 2017, 2018, and 2019, but the new report noted that it examines several years of data, which offers more in-depth analysis of the thinking and behavior of mass attackers. The center defines a mass attack as one in which three or more people, not including the attacker, were harmed. The report noted that nearly two thirds of attackers showed behaviors or communications that were so concerning they should have been met with an immediate response. It said these concerns were often shared with law enforcement, employers, school workers, or parents, but in twenty percent of the cases. The concerning behavior was not communicated to anyone who could do something about it. Ninety-six percent of the attackers were men. The attackers ranged in age from fourteen to eighty-seven. The report called for greater attention toward violence at home. It noted that half of the attackers. Had a history of domestic violence or hatred toward women. About half the attacks in the study involved workplace violence related to coworkers, customers, or businesses. The report said workplaces should establish behavioral threat assessment programs to prevent possible violence, and it said businesses should work with law enforcement. To deal with incidents involving a concern for violence, the report also found that firearms were used in seventy-three percent of incidents. Mass shootings happen often in the United States, but American lawmakers remain divided 
on how to deal with the gun violence. Democrats are calling for more gun control measures, while Republicans' calls center on mental health and increased security. Last June, the U.S. Supreme Court expanded the right to carry guns outside the home. The court struck down a state law in New York that required people to show a specific need to carry a firearm in public. American technology company Microsoft has announced a new multi-billion-dollar investment in artificial intelligence (AI) developer OpenAI. The deal marks the latest deepening of ties between the two companies. Microsoft first invested in OpenAI in 2019 when it put one billion dollars into the company. Microsoft officials did not name a number for the latest investment, but people with knowledge of talks between the two companies recently told Reuters news agency the amount was at least ten billion dollars. OpenAI is a research and development company centered on AI projects. The startup was launched in late 2015 by American billionaire Elon Musk and others. On its website, OpenAI declares that it exists to ensure that artificial general intelligence (AGI) benefits all of humanity. The company defines AGI as highly autonomous systems that outperform humans at economically valuable work. In late November, OpenAI launched a free writing tool called ChatGPT. The launch led to widespread media attention about the current possibilities involving new developments. In AI, ChatGPT is part of a new generation of machine learning systems designed to produce many forms of human-like writing. The tool can autonomously produce complex documents in seconds. Technology experts have said such systems have the possibility to greatly change many different industries and professions. ChatGPT is so good at writing school reports that some officials in the United States have blocked the system on school devices and networks in an effort to prevent students from cheating. Another open AI product called Dolly can produce realistic images and art from a simple description in natural language. Basic versions of the two open AI products are free to the public. As part of its partnership, Microsoft provides supercomputing systems to open AI. To support the development of new AI products, ChatGPT and Dolly require powerful computers to operate the machine learning models the systems use. OpenAI says the tools can produce human-like results because they have been trained on huge amounts of data. A range of materials, including digital books, online writings, and other media, are fed into ChatGPT and Dolly to permit the tools to learn complex skills. In a statement announcing its new investment in OpenAI, Microsoft said it will continue to deploy OpenAI's models. Across many of its product lines, specifically, Microsoft said its partnership with OpenAI will permit the company to expand offerings in its Azure OpenAI service. 
Azure is Microsoft's cloud computing service. Microsoft said Azure OpenAI service helps developers build new AI systems by making OpenAI's models available to its users. Microsoft said that since 2016, it centered on efforts aimed at building Azure into an AI supercomputer for the world. Rowan Curran is an expert with the market research company Forrester. He told the Associated Press he thinks it currently makes good sense for OpenAI and Microsoft to expand their relationship. There's lots of ways that the models that OpenAI is building would be really appealing for Microsoft's set of offerings, Curran said. For example, OpenAI models could help produce writing and images for new business presentations or create smarter word processors. The technology could also help Microsoft's own search engine, Bing, compete more effectively with Google. AI could make Bing more user-friendly by providing search results that include more complete answers, rather than just links. OpenAI noted in a statement that it will still be governed by its non-profit arm and that it remains a capped profit company. OpenAI did not, however, identify what limits it sets on profits. Microsoft's investment came days after the company confirmed it was cutting 10,000 workers, representing about 5% of its total workforce. The company said the reductions were linked to macroeconomic conditions and changing customer needs. I'm Brian Lynn. Now, Brian Lynn joins me to talk more about this week's technology report. Hi, Brian. Thanks for being here. Of course, Ashley. Glad to be here. Your report looked at a new investment Microsoft has made in a major artificial intelligence developer, OpenAI. We learned that OpenAI has created a product that can produce complex human-like writing in a matter of seconds. The product, ChatGPT, has recently received a lot of media attention for producing high-quality results. What are technology experts expecting this big new investment to give Microsoft? So this partnership between the two companies goes back to 2019 when Microsoft invested its first $1 billion. At the time, it was looking to expand into the AI space and has continued to do so. Right now, experts say Microsoft can use a lot of OpenAI's systems to support its own AI offerings. Microsoft already has an AI-specific product called Azure OpenAI, which brings improved AI tools to its Azure cloud computing system. The report also notes Microsoft's search engine Bing could be improved with OpenAI's technology. What are some possibilities there? Well, Marketing experts have suggested Microsoft is likely to add some more user-friendly tools to its search engine. Among them are expected to be new tools to enable users to interact more naturally with the search engine. So, for example, a user could ask more specific questions and have the search engine provide more complete answers besides just giving internet links. So this probably means we can expect to see AI technology used a lot more with search engines generally. Yes, this is the case, and experts are also saying there's likely to be a lot of AI development in the area of customer service. 
So the goal is for companies to create interactive systems that are so natural that people will not know they're doing business with a machine. Okay. Well, thanks again, Brian, for joining us and for the additional explanations. You're welcome, Ashley. Thank you. Welcome to the Making of a Nation: American History in VOA Special English. America's 18th president, Ulysses Grant, was elected to his second term in 1872. Grant had led the Union Army of the North to victory over the Confederate Army of the South during the Civil War. He easily won the presidency in 1868 in the first election held after the war. Now he would spend four more years as president of the United States. Harry Monroe and Kay Gallant tell about Grant's second term in office. Grant's first administration was marked by dishonesty and shameful events. The situation grew much worse after he won a second term. Grant himself was not involved directly, but his administration suffered because of his ties to those who were involved. Soon after Grant's re-election, for example, there was a serious incident. That involved many of his supporters in Congress. The Union Pacific Railroad Company had helped build a railroad across the American West to California. The cost of building the railroad was very high. The company got large amounts of aid from the government. Not all this aid came honestly. An investigation showed that leading members of Congress, and even the vice president, received shares of ownership in the company for free, or at low cost. In exchange, they voted to use federal money to help build the railroad. A few months later, members of Congress. Voted a pay raise for themselves, and the executive branch of government. The pay raise would be retroactive. This meant the extra money would be paid for the two years already passed. Newspapers and citizens raised a storm of protest. Some lawmakers were afraid they would not be reelected, so. They refused to accept the pay raise. Within six months, another shameful incident was uncovered. This one involved Jay Cook, one of the richest bankers in the country. He also was a good friend of President Grant. In 1869, Cook began raising money to build another railroad. Across America's West, he planned to sell one hundred million dollars worth of railroad bonds. Many people invested all the money they had in Cook's railroad, but Cook was unable to sell as many bonds as he expected. Soon, his banks had no money left; they could return no money. To the thousands of people who had bought railroad bonds, people hurried to other banks to withdraw their savings. Within hours, many of these other banks had to close; they too were out of money. Within a month, more than five thousand banks across the country failed and closed their doors. This created an economic crisis. The New York Stock Exchange closed for ten days. Factories closed. Thousands of people lost their jobs. Investigations showed that many of the banks that failed 
had violated banking laws. The laws often were not enforced because so many bankers had given money to the ruling Republican Party. Other incidents followed. One of the biggest was called the Whiskey Ring. It involved a group of whiskey producers and some high officials who were friends of President Grant. Together, they found a way not to pay taxes on their whiskey. One of Grant's close advisors was at the center of the incident. A grand jury found him not guilty of any crime. However, it charged several hundred whiskey producers and government officials with illegal activities. President Grant had done nothing illegal, but the whiskey ring incident increased public feeling that there was no honesty in the White House. The feeling grew that Grant was a failure. These incidents took place during a time of intense social and political change in the United States. The period after the Civil War was a time of industrial revolution and business growth. Most of this growth was taking place in the North. Before the Civil War, most businesses were small. Now there were many companies with large numbers of workers. The companies also had large numbers of owners. They sold shares of ownership to anyone with enough money to buy. A few men rose to positions of great power in business. In the steel industry, for example, there was Andrew Carnegie. He came to the United States as a boy from Scotland. He took a low-paying job in a factory that produced cotton cloth. He worked hard. In time, he earned enough money to take control of an iron factory. Carnegie soon built another factory. This one produced steel with a new technology. The system worked well. Soon he was earning more than one million dollars a year. He competed fiercely with other steel companies. He pressured railroads to transport his steel for lower prices than his competitors, and he cut his prices. To force other steel makers out of the business. Before long, Andrew Carnegie was the unquestioned leader of America's steel industry. His position gave him great power over the economy of the whole country. What Carnegie did for the steel industry, John D. Rockefeller did for the oil industry. Oil became a useful product only in the middle of the 1800s. Rockefeller was part of a group of businessmen who built an oil processing center in Ohio. It was so successful that Rockefeller gave up his other business interests. He put all his money into oil production. He formed. The Standard Oil Company of Ohio. John D. Rockefeller's new company used the same aggressive business methods as Andrew Carnegie. Rockefeller bought control of other oil processing companies. He started price wars that forced his competitors out of business. Most important. Rockefeller made a secret deal with the railroads. The deal greatly reduced his transportation costs. This permitted him to crush his competition. Before long, he controlled ninety-five percent of the oil processing industry in the United States. As with steel and oil. 
America's railroads were an extremely important business in the 1800s. In fact, they were the nation's biggest business. They were as important as automobiles and airplanes are to the American economy today. Before the Civil War, most railroads were east of the Mississippi River. Most were small lines. In the years after the war, four major railroads got control of almost all the lines in the east, and they began building new lines in the west. The first rail line to cross the nation was completed in 1869. It was built by two companies. One company started from the east and went west. The other went in the opposite direction. Finally, after six years of back-breaking labor, the two work teams met in northern Utah. They connected the rail lines with a golden spike. It was a great moment in the nation's history. Now, at last, the two coasts of the United States were united by a single line of metal rail. It was like the day a hundred years later, when the first American walked on the moon. Like the steel and oil industries, the railroad industry also had its stories of intense business competition. In this case, the most influential man was Cornelius Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt already was rich from the shipping industry. Now he formed the New York Central Railroad. It was the largest railroad in the East. Cornelius Vanderbilt tried to take over the railroad industry. He was not as successful as Andrew Carnegie with steel or John D. Rockefeller with oil. A group of other rich railroad owners blocked his plans. But Vanderbilt did succeed in winning a great amount of power and influence. Vanderbilt and the other new leaders of industry were powerful, and they let others know it. They sometimes made statements about how they did not have to obey the law. Other powerful men thought the same way. Some were officials elected or appointed to serve in the federal government. Political power blinded them to their responsibility to be honest and fair to the public. As a result, the Republican Party lost public support. The blame was placed on Ulysses Grant. 